Britt. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. How are things? And they're they're uh, gradually getting better. I'm just uh, trying to take it day by day. That's awesome. So what's the weather like there in Georgia? It's super crappy right now. <laughs> um, oh, that's no it's good. It's like unseasonably warm, but it's raining. So yeah, it's uh, today's been a little pretty crappy, but um, I'm hoping for good weather this weekend so I get in, can get out on the bike. I'm, get I'm ripping. Absolutely. Plans. Our good weather is going to be 32. So if you could ride for me, that'd be great. Sure. Yes, I will do that for you specifically. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try my heated gear on. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, dude. Even with my heated gear, 40, 40 is pretty much my limit. Even with my heated gloves. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I have the uh, field shear heated gear it plugs into the bike, and I know you're kind of not a big plugging it into the bike, but you can cook with that stuff on. It's just, that's what I've heard. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you tell everyone about you? All right. So. I'm Brittany. Hi. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, I created Brit Brap um, as kind of my personal brand because I wanted to be motorcycle related, but um, which the word, that's where the brap comes from, obviously. But um, I kind of wanted it to be more unique because I want to reach my content beyond just motorcycling because. As we previously talked discussed, um, we are more than just you know motorcycles. And mm -hmm. it, yes, it is an increasingly engulfing, all, all, encomp uh, all, bleh, bleh, all encompassing. Um, I do a lot in that my bloopers, like bleh, bleh, yeah. Um, it's it's really an all encompassing sport and and hobby for some of us, but. There, there's still more and more to us than just motorcycles. So anyway, that's kind of where the idea of Brit Brat came from. Um, and I've been wanting to start a YouTube channel for probably ever since I got my motorcycle in 2017. But nice. uh, my husband tried it and he just, it was just too much work for him. And he, he's not a creative anyway. I'm a graphic designer and a video editor by trade. So it's not, it wasn't, it came more naturally to me than him. Um, but I was honestly just afraid to start. I didn't feel like I really had a good story to tell um, until my accident happened. Um, so for those of us who, those of us, for those of you who don't know, um, I was at Blood Mountain in Blairsville, Georgia on June 20th of 2020. So this past June, about seven months ago, probably eight months ago. Anyway, um, Oh my God, it was eight months yesterday. Anyway. Um, wow. Well, congrats. Cause that yeah. we'll get into that too, but yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I was riding alone up at Blood Mountain. I was with a group of friends, but no one was with me at the time that I was, you know, riding the mountain. My front wheel hit oil and then I low sided into um, a ravine. It was about 20 feet down. And um, realized no one could see me from the street and no one saw it happen and no one could see my bike. So I had to crawl up and it turns out that I broke my back in about eight or eight to 10 places. Uh, one specifically um, was my T8 thoracic part of my spine was a burst fracture, which means that my spinal cord was exposed, which means at any point of this, you know, of that event, I could have been paralyzed. Um, so um, when I went to the hospital, actually, they said it was a miracle that I was not paralyzed and I could feel everything still. Um, wow. So, yeah, that was that was pretty dramatic. But in recovery, um, as I was, um, you know, working my way through it, I was feeling a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression and I felt like I was alone. But mm -hmm. the more I told everyone else about it, I talked to some friends and I realized that I wasn't alone and everyone, it, no matter, you know, the extent of the crash, most everyone who experiences something like this, or maybe not even as dramatic as what I went through does experience some kind of anxiety and depression from that. So I decided to share my story and that's how my YouTube channel started. Um, I wanted to share my story and kind of encourage other people that got on a motorcycle accident to get back on the bike if that's truly what they're passionate about because if i could do it i feel like anyone else could do it because i did not realize how strong i was until i had to be strong 
So yeah. Um, I, hanging, I watched that video fire. that you did about not feeling alone. And that's, that's a tough video to watch because you really opened up your soul. And I was like, wow, that's, I give people a lot of credit because it's, as a creator, you can, it's bad enough when people say your work sucks, but it's bad enough when they say you suck, <laughs> you know, or, or they have some yeah, sort of negative personal. comment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's more personal if you have a YouTube channel because you're really putting yourself out there. Because if they yeah. say your content sucks, well, does that, doesn't that mean I suck because it's me? But yeah, but, it, but, anyway. but I think it's even worse when it's the personal attack, right? Yes. Because it, it, you're very vulnerable at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what makes... I guess there's a difference between content and legitimate content, if that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely, yeah. And we didn't we didn't get into what do you what do you ride? Uh, my XSR um, 900. So nice. That's a, it's a 2019 XSR 900. Um, she's what I wrecked on, and the only thing that happened to her was you know, she's really scratched up, which I don't really care to be honest. She's still my baby. Mm -hmm. um, bent handlebars and a broken radiator hose. That's all that happened to her. Wow. And she's just perfect. Um, as far as, you know, I'm concerned, of course, I had to report all the scratches and all the dents to my insurance agent, um, which then, you know, helps me give her a few um, upgrades. Um, but I, like the scratches are still in her tank. She still has got, you know, a few dents in her tank and, you know, um, the, it happened on, she, I landed on my left side. So, um, my exhaust pipe got scratched up just from it being flown, being flown into the woods. Um, my bike protection, um, frame sliders completely saved my bike. I had engine sliders as well. Um, those were ground down to the actual engine. So I had scratches on my engine cover engine case. Wow. Um, but nothing was wrong because of those frame sliders. So if I did not have bike protection, Athena, um, would have been completely screwed. I mean, I, I would have had to, she would have been told them total 100% if I did not have protection on her. So, wow. yeah. Um, and of course that's the first thing that I did was upgraded her protection. Got that, got that fixed. Um, that was the first thing I did when, uh, I could, you know, afford to fix her up again. So, sure. So what I've often wondered about this and I don't know how deep you want to go into it, but so you wreck, Right. And, and I can't imagine that that experience. Is it your survival instinct that kicked in that, that allowed you? Because if I remember correctly, you you weren't seen. Right. Yeah. You were completely hidden from the road. I could hear um, motorcycles and cars pass and I was yelling for help, um, but no one was coming. And then I looked around and realized that I couldn't see the road and I couldn't see my bike. So I knew no one probably knew I was down there. So I knew at that point it was either stay here and no one would ever find me and die or climb up for help. So at that time, you know, I was screaming as, as I was climbing up that ravine and it's just, it was fight or flight 100%. And I chose to now, fight. Were you able to walk or no. were you crawling at that point? I'm I sorry was, if that's a stupid question. No, I'm just no, trying no, to visualize okay. what happened. Um, and, you know, a lot of people do break their backs and they're still able to walk. Um, you know, so breaking your back doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have aftermarket parts. Um, but I was, because my T8 was a burst fracture, um, they did have to fuse my spine from T7 through T9. Um, so I do have aftermarket parts. In fact, it's kind of cool. I'm like one of those burst people who think this is cool. Um, you can run your hand or run across my back and you can actually feel my screws sticking out. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So um, my husband knows not to touch me in the, I, I, on those first four spots. And I So actually, you've been upgraded. You're not the standard. You're not the stock exactly. model. Yes. Uh, see, he made out in the deal. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, Joey knows not to touch me in those four spots specifically. And um, I still don't have feeling in it like, probably this, this much my back because of the nerve damage, um, that, you know, I ensued whenever they did cut into me. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I crawled up the ravine. I was actually on my side. Um, so I crawled up 
And then I waved down help. And I was, I remember I was on my left side when I was waving down help. Um, and I did not want to move off of my side, but the motorcyclist who found me, um, he's actually one of my really, really good friends. Now I talk to him. I talk about him a lot in my channel. His name is Giuseppe. Um, I didn't know him before this event very well, actually. I maybe saw, said hi to him once or twice. Um, and then we got to know each other real well. Um, and yeah, um, he told me that he needed to neutralize my spine, which is exactly what he was supposed to do. Um, so he rolled me on my back and for, I waited for the ambulance for an hour. Um, and cause I mean, they can only go so fast up in those mountains. Um, and it basically he laid on top of me, like in a plank stance and I hugged him and held my upper body up off of the ground for at least 30 minutes. Um, and then eventually the paramedics did show up, um, fire showed up before the ambulance, but they, uh, cut, out, cut my suit off of me and put me on the stretcher and then, you know, took me away. But yeah, I, uh, they wanted me to try to get up and I was like, no, they, and everyone thought I had broken ribs. Um, no one thought it was my back that, that got injured. Um, wow. when I was in the hospital, um, they kept me on the gurney, um, on the hardboard and even the admitting, um, doctors were surprised to see that I was, I had a broken back and the admitting doctor told me I would never ride on my motorcycle again and talk about a freaking anxiety attack. Like that, that was the worst part, but yeah. So no, I couldn't walk. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that, and that speaks to having somebody there, I guess, that knew how to respond versus somebody that doesn't ride and was just absolutely like, oh, get up. You'll be fine. Um, absolutely. And, you know, I will say that he did tell me to take off my helmet and immediately I, I refused. I was like, I'm not taking off this helmet mm -hmm. until paramedics, paramedics come because that's the one thing I remember from my basic riders course. Never take off your helmet. Um, unless your air, airway, unless you can't breathe, um, because you don't know, you know, if something were to happen to your upper back. So I knew not to do that. And so I refused. Um, I had my RI, that's the helmet that I was wearing. Mm -hmm. Um, I had that sucker for a week. <laughs> I had just bought that $800 helmet, which I get a discount because my husband work at, works at Mountain Motorsports. I always need to say that because I like to be transparent with that. Um, but, and that right there speaks to why gear matters. Absolutely. Um, I love the people that go on Amazon and like, I found this helmet for 50 bucks. Is your head worth 50 bucks? Oh, uh, oh my God. Like, uh, I just, I, some people have to touch the fire before to know it's hot. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that's the case. And for so many people who don't wear gear while they're on their motorcycle, you know, sometimes they have to realize that sometimes they, their skin have to be a part of the pavement to realize they actually need a jacket. So yeah. I just, anyway, that's one of my soap boxes. <laughs> I think was it's a valid soap box. I mean, I think it's a great soap box. Um, it was my soap box before it happened. Um, so I was practicing. Like I was one of the and still am one of the safest riders you could ever, you know, ride with. Cause I go to the parking lot and I I've spent hours upon hours practicing and just getting to know my motorcycle and learning how to do just like U-turns and weird stuff, just because none of this stuff comes naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, I could barely ride a bicycle and let alone a motorcycle. So um, yeah. Um, I just, I wasn't going fast in the mountains and a lot of people think that if you're not going fast, nothing can happen. And that's just not true. Um, I was not going above 50% of my skill level. I was probably going around 40 miles an hour around that turn. And, you know, it wasn't anything that really, I, I it's not one of the things you can really catch it happen while it's happening. Mm -hmm. So I've saved rear 
slide outs before. Um, I've hit gravel before. I've slid on paint on the on the road. But this, it was just instantaneous. One minute I was looking through the turn. The next minute my, hel- my helmet was, you know, dragging the pavement. So it's just, it's not, you know, um, I still think most accidents can be avoided. And I think that accident could have been avoided um, had I paid more attention to the road before I was, you know, riding on it. Um, I could, I should have seen the oil as I was going through the turn, but I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. So that I was just trying to learn the road while I was on it. And, you know, that it, it, it happened, but I'm not mad it happened. I mean, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. Now I'm assuming you wear full leathers. Yes. Um, so I was in a full leather suit when that happened. And um, the one, I have to preface this with, even if I was wearing a back protector, the way I landed, because I landed on my shoulders with my body over me, like I, I the, the ground was right here. Okay. So I landed on my shoulders and basically my back just folded. So I don't know. And even my surgeon said he doesn't think a back protector would have saved me from that. However, I just think it's terribly ironic that the one day I choose not to wear a freaking back protector. <laughs> I break my back. (laughs) Um, It also happened to be, I was supposed to go on a group ride with um, one of my cruiser friends with the leaders of Atlanta that day. And I bailed on her to go to uh, the mountains with a group of girlfriends. And that also happened. (laughs) So she still gives me shit about it. She's my, uh, she's my hairstylist. So, um, it's just, it's just funny that, you know, she can poke at me like that. But, uh, but yeah, I just, it's incredibly ironic that, you know, the one day I didn't wear a back protector, you know, now I do think that if I was wearing a, um, a airbag vest, like the one I just reviewed on my most recent video, um, shameless plug. Yes. (laughs) I had to dude. Um, You got it. It's all about plugging (laughs) the channel. It's true. Um, if I was wearing an airbag like that, I don't think it would have been nearly as severe. I probably could would have still, you know, fractured a few vertebrae um, just because of the compression fractures. But I don't think I would have, um, it would have folded as dramatically as it did. But, okay. uh, but yeah, so. And that's a pretty high tech device. I've seen them. I've never, I've never used one, but that's, that's a lot going on there. Oh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I didn't know about really airbags until Joey told me about that one because he wanted me to get it when, once it got out, um, mm-hmm. cause it came out in September and my accident was in June. So as soon as he got word that they were getting some men, we pre-ordered it and I actually paid full price for that one. So nice. I would get it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just incredible that the amount of research and development that goes into those products, especially from Alpine stars, which I'm a huge, a stars junkie. I will say that. Um, however, I don't, I'm awkwardly shaped. So I don't fit into their off the rack track suits, which is why I huh? went the custom route. Um, I ordered my first track suit, um, custom track suit after my accident, but unfortunately I was bitten by, the company, um, I got a full refund, so I went with another company. It's actually coming in tomorrow. So nice. Really excited. Now, is it logoed <laughs> up with all your brand, or? Um, so they made me. I, I I created my logo after I ordered the suit, so okay. they didn't um, include my logo in it, but I they did make me a custom patch. So I'm gonna be nice. getting it um, sewed on sewn on to my suit, and it's it's about it's about this big. So I don't know where it's going to go yet, awesome. but I just, I wanted the wonder woman logo. Um, and then it's got, that seems uh, fitting. Thank you. And it's got, um, I'm going to, you know, plug in venom, uh, undersuits, um, just personally, because I was wearing a venom undersuit when I did wreck and they had to cut it off of me in the hospital. And then a few, cause it, you know, they're, they're really tight. I couldn't lift my arms up or, you know, anything. So, um, they ended up cutting off of me. And then about four weeks later, I got one in the mail because she heard what happened. 
and wow. she didn't she didn't offer to you know to charge me or anything so i have to like i and i've got her logo there now because of that um and they're not cheap um so anyway um shoot and I mean, just the overall support that i got after my accident um it's just overwhelming and you know i i did this last night and i'm gonna have to do it again tonight blood mountain riders um they're a facebook group for the blood mm-hmm. mountain area um there had to have been at least 30 motorcyclists around me when i when they found me i mean the the amount of support that that group provided for me i mean there was a guy who sat there like standing over me holding a helmet over my head so i so i wouldn't get sunburned for an hour <laughs> like it's just the amount of support they, they gave me a nobody no one knew me and it's just now i know a lot of people from that incident and so when i went down there to you know revisit that area with some friends i didn't feel comfortable enough to go down and see the turn yet but we were there in a car up at mountains crossing and i got to see people that i hadn't seen since you know i was on the ground looking up at them so it was pretty pretty darn cool to i think it's amazing what this community will do for each other absolutely dude yeah. and i didn't realize it until then well, not even in, in the same category, but Katie, my wife, when we were in the Adirondacks, so I'm sorry, we were in the cats Adirondacks, she took a yellow jacket to her arm because, again, it was the one day she didn't wear her jacket. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that bike was stopped. And all you could hear is the decels behind me and people were like pulling over and blocking the road. And I was like, you know, it's just it's crazy, but it's really true. I mean, bikers look out for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. It's and just I think it's because they understand it. Yeah, it's a completely unspoken bond. There's only a few people that I've ever met in the community who I didn't feel really connected to. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's always certain people that you just, you know, they go their own way and that's okay. Absolutely. Now you've, um, I mean, obviously gear is a big part of your life. So you have, a, you run Shelly too, is right? Yes. So okay. the reason my first ever helmet was a, an Icon Armada and it was a space base. I got it because it looked cool. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do. Uh, icons are beautiful, but they're not, they're, they're a good, no, they're, they're a decent entry level helmet. Um, we picked mm-hmm. it up for a buck 50, but uh, it whistled whenever I were to put the visor down Um, and I ended up losing quite a bit of weight. So at that time I was a large, I went down to a small. So it, it was the point where I could shake my head and it was moving. And so my husband made me get another helmet. And so we went to showy, but we were still budget friendly. So I got my current showy. Um, oh my God, can we pause the, can we pause it? Can I go get my helmets? Go. So I'm a complete gear nerd as well, <laughs> but uh, I actually have my helmets here, so I want to show them off. Is that okay? Sure. Let's see them. Uh, my first helmet was an Icon Armada, which is a decent entry-level helmet. Um, I don't really recommend them because I put more value on my head and my brain than 150 bucks. but this was my helmet, and that's exactly why I bought it. Nice. So, he's a space base face. That's what it's called. Space, space, space. Um, Icon Armada. And uh, the helmet actually doesn't seal. So whenever I were to go down the street, um, it would whistle. And my husband could hear it too. Um, and which that, that really annoyed him. But, you know, it was pretty. That's why I got it. And I'm, I'm, I've always got it. You'll never see me without a bow on my helmet. So, And then from there, I upgraded to my Shoei RF 1200. And um, I upgraded because I lost a bunch of weight. Um, so I have a thing to where I don't like to be like other people. Um, and I am so super into customization, um, like way more than I should be. So I'm switching out 
my bow because I don't have a bow for this helmet, but this is my RF 1200. Nice. Yeah. Oh, so I love it. It took me nine hours to bedazzle this sucker. Um, and yeah, you really can't talk to my wife, just so we're clear. One that's after another. She would do. That's <laughs> awesome. One after another, all of these were placed. And uh, I had someone, I took this to track last year, and I had someone complain that I had spikes on my helmet, and I was like, they're plastic. And they're like, oh, they look, they look like glass. They look sharp. And I was like, no, they're not sharp. Um, they do come off, though. I've got one missing right there, but I need to re re replace it. That's yeah, awesome. Um, so I still wear her at um, parking lot drills. Um, I don't like to wear my most recent one because she's really, really expensive. But <laughs> that's so weird. I'm calling them she. <laughs> hey, man, whatever works. Um, but before I reveal her, because she's really special, um, I'm going to share my awry um and this is the girl i wrecked in so technically i did get my awry after my showy rf 1200 um i wanted to advance up my protection and arise 100 known for protection um but i had her for a week before i had an accident so oh. i think we covered that earlier yeah but i didn't customize her because she literally was so beautiful. I, I just, I, I didn't want to do anything to her. Like I have my bow and that's all I did, but that's what Oof. happened. Yep. That's where my head drugged the pavement, but because of her, I didn't have a concussion. So wow. she's the reason why my head is still here. <laughs> um, and so the reason why I didn't stay with her eye um, was because, now, before I say this, um, I could have had the cheek, pad, cheek pads on wrong. Um, it's very, very possible because her eye is kind of hard to maneuver their cheek pads in. Um, not nearly as um, straightforward as showy is, but it took about four people, four motorcyclists who knew what they were doing to take uh to use the emergency release system because it was oh, wow. just hard to pull it out yeah um someone had to hold the helmet still why while, while two people took each side of the cheek pad and pull it out like it, it shouldn't be that hard no it shouldn't be so that's exactly why i didn't stay with her eye and my husband had an, a showy x14 which is their top of the line, line race helmet um so I got my X14 because he loved his so nice. much. I initially didn't get an X14 because I tried his on. It was just wasn't comfortable, but he has a smaller head than me. So he's, he's a, he's a little, we're, we're the same size. I don't like to wear high heels around him because it makes me feel gigantic. But <laughs> so about customization, I bought this black and then my friend Giuseppe, um, He's he wraps with uh you know he used to do car wrapping a few years ago so he knows how to you know manipulate vinyl so he wrapped it in solid colors and then I cut out a bunch of little hexagons then I individually placed these hexagons on my helmet. That's and so cool. That's where my logo comes from, and that's why I have hexagons all over my helmet is because I do in my logo. And then, of course, I have to have my unicorn because I shit rainbows. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, now that's that's the race version, but they make a street version too, right? They do now. Okay. Um, which I reviewed that one too. Um, oh, it was pretty cool though, because I was actually the second person on YouTube to review the Showy X, the new Showy RF fourteen hundred, um, because Joey okay. had that before you know it went out. So. But the Shelly R1400 is at the same price 
of the Shoei RF 1200, mm -hmm. but it's got the same engineering as the X14, but it's geared towards street riding. So yeah. I like the X14 because on the XSR 900, sorry, I'm going to call the sack. Okay. That's not for me. Um, I like the X14 because it cuts through the wind and on my XSR 900, it's an upright bike. And while I do have a windshield, it still helps a little bit to have a, have a uh, helmet cut through the wind like this X14 does. Um, and the RF, I get the numbers confused all the time. <laughs> the RF 1200 just felt like I was being shaken around a lot because mm -hmm. my head had so much wind going over it. But the X14 is just, it's quieter in my opinion. Um, I do wear earplugs. Um, so, you know, that's, it's, it's all relevant, but, um, but yeah, um, I, I, I'm going to cry if I ever were to have to replace this helmet. Um, my, my husband's is just as fancy actually. So after I did this, my husband wanted his to look the same. So his is high vis. Um, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, but on my Instagram page in my, um, you know how you have, uh, highlights on your mm -hmm. Instagram homepage. I've got one that's got my art, which I do draw as well. Um, and then I have custom helmets because I do custom helmet work on the side because I'm trying to afford more track days this year. So nice. if anyone wants anything, you know, vinyl wrapped or designed or um, I plan on getting some, actually I have this right here. I'm going to be bedazzling this one and selling it. She's dusty, but I'm going to be bedazzling and selling this HJC. Um, nice. Just because I, I know a few Harley riders who would kill for a bedazzled helmet. Um. But yeah, so I do all this stuff on the side and I also do um, custom artwork as well. So I'll show you. Yeah, that. I need I need to get a new logo. So yeah. <laughs> and it's not really so much I need the new logo. We just need to get you a track day. So it, it'll yeah. work. Yeah. That's that, awesome. that's, there yeah, is we have the um but yeah, this is my husband's helmet. Oh, so that's you could cool. probably you could probably no, that's that's someone else. You shit sorry come on uh well it's not here shit i gotta post it anyway i'll send you some pictures to put on the screen i guess awesome um but yeah so that's uh i'm trying to come up with some alternative ways to come up with track day cash this year because track days are pretty pretty darn expensive and when both you and your husband want to do it it's double the price sure so, and that's the number one thing that's going to get me to, you know, be ready to race one day because after this accident, that's what I want to do is I want to be on the racetrack. That's awesome. <laughs> that's really awesome. So that's yeah, the end goal. You, you don't, um, it, everything's cheap until your spouse is involved. And then oh my God. Isn't and that... It's like double everything. Oh, but, um, we had, um, we had speed and strength helmets. The, I forget which ones they were and they were okay. And then we got the showy RF, whatever they are, RF. I, I always screw it up. It's the RFSF or something like that. Yeah, it's I the, think that's the one before the RF 12. Yeah. 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 And, and I, they're, they're nice, but I, I really want to. Now I saw the 1400. I'm like, oh, that's what I want next. Mm -hmm. I, I had a Schubert for the longest time. But oh, it those are nice. Too, right. though. But it was so quiet. Oh, my God. It was That's great. what they're known for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, my have that was humming good. and, you know, it was really yeah. nice. My Arai was quiet. Um, and, you know, the thing about Arai's, which I loved, is um, they're so customizable. Like, their they're cheap pads come in all different sizes. Their they're internal um, pads, they come apart, and you can resize those individual parts of the padding. So you can literally customize it to your head, which I was in the process of doing that when I wrecked. But... I believe the 1400 is the same way. I know the X14 is. Um, so make sure you look into that. I can't verify that right now. Unfortunately. I should probably just, you know, accidentally drop my helmet this weekend. And 
you know, have to replace it. Um, that's another one of my pet peeves <laughs> that people, cause I, I've, I've had friends who drop, drop their helmets from like, um, a few feet up, just, you know, drop them off their bike. And I, I've dropped my RF 1200 before, but I was at work with Joey one day, just hanging out over there. Cause it's all like a family over at mountain and a kid picked up one of their helmets unsupervised picked up one of the helmets and dropped it from a foot and it spidered oh. and it was oh. it, it was a uh, one of the expensive arise the same day um a teenager comes in there looks at the most expensive um x14 on the shelf and drops it and it, it spidered as well but i mean they're not they're only dropping this from three to four feet off the ground but once it spiders yeah. Uh, when I say spidering, that means like the in, the mm -hmm. internal, um, you can kind of see um, it's the styrofoam literally spiders out where it's impacted. Um, but it's just it, a simple drop can ruin your helmet. And so I am so anal about where I put my helmet <laughs> now after that happened, because I didn't really realize how fragile they were until I was at Joey's work and that happened. And he lost yeah. two top of the line helmets on the same day. One, I dropped my Schubert and I was like, well, that was the end of that. <laughs> oh my God. I just, it gives me a heart attack uh, whenever I almost drop it. I don't even like putting her on the ground. So, um, but yeah, so. Uh, now, did you ride <laughs> before you got, you met Joey? No, actually. Um, really? Uh, oh, just wait. Um, I'm going to have a video come out about this in a few weeks. Okay. I keep dropping those, man. Um, I hated motorcycles and okay. motorcycle riders before I started riding. Like the, the type of cager that you hate on the road, that was me. I would do anything in my power to make riding a motorcycle miserable if there was a motorcycle rider next to me. Like I was horrible and I just didn't, I just didn't understand how someone could put a death machine between their legs. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, the closest I'd ever been to riding on a motorcycle is I had a go-kart when I was little that that's the closest I'd ever been. And I rode on the back of my brother's Harley probably about four months before Joey got a motorcycle and, um, I hated it 100%. I don't like not being in control. And in mm -hmm. fact, I've, I've ridden bitch on Joey's 636 once. And I was like, never again. Nope. Not for me. Um, I was talking to Joey's mother um, to, cause Joey had been ever since we had been together. And this was about since, you know, we had been together for about five years at that time. Um, he's always wanted a motorcycle. And I mean, I, it's not like I was against it, but we just didn't have the cash at the time. So I was trying to see if Joey's mom would work with me and we'd go halfsies on a, an R3 or some kind of, you know, small bike for him. Well, she got him, she got him one for his birthday. So she beat me to it. Wow. Um, yeah, that was just another story, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so he got the R3. They took him to a parking lot and he was in, a, in tennis shoes, shorts and like no gear whatsoever, learning how to ride a motorcycle. Well, he, he rode dirt bikes growing up. So he, and he can ride a bicycle without any hands. Like he, it, he was a natural at it. And then he tried to teach me in a parking lot because I was like, you know, you've got one. I might as well try. So I was never against it after he got one. Um, so he took me to a parking lot. I dropped the R3 three times. And I was like, you know what? I'm not learning. I'm not learning well from you. And I don't. He tries to teach me stuff, even at the track. I just don't take advice from him well at all. Um, and he knows that. And no one's here. It's okay. Off. Sorry. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go take a Harley course. So 
I took the Harley Riders safety course, which I recommend everyone do because mm-hmm. uh, you cannot replace, please excuse my dogs. She's an asshole. Um, you cannot replace genuine um, lessons and genuine instruction sure. from actual certified coaches. Um, and after the course I took, I was on the R3 more than he was. Wow. So two weeks later, <laughs> um, Joe was tired of me stealing the motorcycle. So he went out and he bought a Kawasaki um, Ninja 650. Um, and then we rode, I rode for about a year. And then we both upgraded that next following year. He upgraded to the 636. I upgraded to my SV650. And then I stayed with the 650 for a year. And then I upgraded that this past May um, to the XSR900. And so I love my X, my my Suzuki SV650, but I felt like I was needing better suspension and better brakes. And I owed too much on the bike to really make sense of spending three thousand more dollars just to upgrade the brakes and suspension. So I wanted the same ergonomics as the SV650, but I wanted the speed and the adrenaline rush of Joey 636. And that's why I got the XSR 900. And so that's my baby. (laughs) Nice. So I felt like that's a really long story for a simple. No, (laughs) I mean, I think it's great. I always think it's funny to to figure out what got people on a bike because not everybody, you know, some people are just kind of like, oh, you know, like I, I, I'm the person that at 20 years old walked into a dealership, picked out a bike, and then I didn't buy it till I was 40. But you know, it was it was the thing of it never left me. You know, uh-huh. like and and everybody has their own path to it. Yeah. You know, some people can go and buy the biggest bike in the world and be fine, and then other people, you know, have to figure it out along the way, which is what I did. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. But I like to share that. Um my origination story, like the, the fact that I hated motorcyclists because genuinely a lot of people think that if you ride a motorcycle today, you've always liked motorcycles, which mm-hmm. I, I never, never thought I would be riding a motorcycle ever. Um, and I just grew up and I was not, I was never grown up around motorcycles. My uncle had one, but I never wanted to ride with him. Um, I just was never attracted to that kind of community and not a kind of community. I was never attracted to that sport. And Mm -hmm. it's just funny to look back and, you know, I've, I'm completely different person now. And I just, I just love the progression that my life kind of took and it led to where I'm at today. (laughs) Now, do you think that that's helped in your ability to recover with the, the, how do I say it? I find for me, at least, that riding a motorcycle seemed like it was so out of what I thought I could do. And and then just once I did it, it was done. It's all I wanted to do. Do you think that that helped in, well, it clearly helped in your recovery because that's all you wanted to do, I'm sure, after the accident. Now, how long did it take you to recover? I'm officially, uh, mm, that's a, that's a loaded question because okay. I'm not technically fully recovered yet. Okay. Um, the first question I had whenever I went back to the, when I had my post-op appointment was when can I get back on the bike? And he said, I really don't want to see you try to get on after until after 90 days, 90 days after my surgery, I was in a parking lot, but and I, I expected it not to go very well. I expected to break down and have an anxiety attack, but it just didn't happen. It just felt normal to me. It felt natural, at least in the parking lot. And when I went out on the road, it was a completely different story. But um, I think it definitely assisted because I was just that passionate about it. But at the same point, during recovery, I had to find myself in other ways because I felt like my my identity had been so uh, so intertwined in the motorcycle 
community and the sport Mm -hmm. that I almost lost myself. And I did lose myself for a few weeks there because I didn't know myself without motorcycles. And I think it's really important to um, have other hobbies besides motorcycling. So that's, um, I was an art student in college and I had never put pen to paper again until I was in recovery. And that helped. I got into reading. I learned how to garden <laughs> um, while I was, you know, stuck in a chair. Um, I mean, I, I, I did go out down and, you know, see my motorcycle every now and then just to make sure she was still there. <laughs> um, but I kind of had to find myself away from motorcycles during recovery just to kind of keep myself hopeful. And, you know, it's there. I, I went through a lot of ups and downs as far as a lot more downs and ups as far as, you know, my happiness without motorcycles. And um, sure. it did get to the point where I just questioned whether or not I wanted to still ride. And I did question whether I, I would be able to ride. And at that point I was like, okay, I'm going to have to do something um, to prove to myself I'm going to be able to go back out there. So my parents have a Can-Am Spider. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we convinced them to buy a Can-Am Spider, and now they're up in now. Now, be honest, Colorado. that was just as exhilarating as a sport bike, right? I got so much crap for talking crap about Can-Am. It was just too funny. No, I mean they're fun, and the Can-Am Spider does have get up. Like my husband got up to one ten very easily on the cam spider now he says the canem rikers are pieces of shit Ooh. um but the spider which is the upgraded version of the riker um I, i'm pretty jealous of them being able to fit their helmets and their saddlebags i'm not gonna lie but um anyway so to prove myself that i could get back on out on the road on a motorcycle the spider was the best thing that i could do because i was not getting back on the back of a sport bike Mm -hmm. um so i did and it was excruciatingly painful but i did it and i was in my brace um my my back brace and i i i just i i needed to prove to myself that i could do it and so i did it and that was 10 weeks post-op wow Um, and i i cried on the way there and i cried on the way home and but i did it and so I did, I did that to my, for myself and my husband didn't want to do it. My mom would not let my dad drive because if anything were to happen, it'd be my dad's fault. <laughs> so Joey, Joey, you know, did that for me. And it's just, yeah, I just had to do it for myself just to prove to myself that I can still do it. Wow. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's having that passion for something you love so much. It's, it, it does help in recovery, but while I say that in the same breath, I did contemplate not riding again. I did, you know, have to question whether or not I still wanted to do it. And there were days where I just didn't want to get out of bed. And there were days where I just, I, I didn't want to move because I, I felt sorry for myself. But um, I think it's, uh, uh, everything that I went through mentally helped me become the stronger per- a stronger person and I don't regret anything and well, I'm honored and I'm proud of myself for saying that and I I, I, as I you should I, be so so how do you I mean I struggle with depression I struggle with anxiety what is your what is your coping mechanism how do you deal with getting that first foot on the floor when you have those days I mean because I can imagine those had to be big days this isn't like I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job I mean this is like life altering. So I didn't, and I wasn't going to seek help until I had my first PTSD attack. Um, and I started, um, it was during a MotoGP race and there was a bike who crashed on the track and it flew in front of Maverick Vinales and Valentino Rossi's head. I mean, like literally right in front of them inches and they, they would have been killed. Um, it wasn't until that, that rider was put on a stretcher and then I laid my head back 
close my eyes, which is probably the worst thing to do. And I just bawled and I felt like I was in the ambulance again. And I felt like it was happening all over to me again. And it took Joey a long time to calm me down. He didn't really know what he was doing. He tried his best, but after a few hours, we had to turn off the race. Of course. Um, I just realized I was like, I'm, I want to, I'm not going to stop riding MotoGP or I'm sorry. I'm not going to stop watching MotoGP. I'm not going to stop watching, you know, my favorite Moto, Moto America races, but I don't want this to happen again. And what, the hell happens if I get an attack like this while I'm on the street, um, while I'm on the motorcycle. Um, so at that moment, I researched PTSD therapy. I, um, you know, found a PTSD therapist around me and she helped me through my PTSD attacks, um, going to therapy and it was all virtual because of COVID. Um, going to therapy and really talking through all my struggles really helped me um, kind of get past that. She taught me a lot of coping mechanisms as well. Um, I do have a video about how I relieve anxiety when I'm on a motorcycle. And one of the things that she taught me is to envision a color. And I saw that. I always feel crazy talking about this. Um, but, but envision but, a color. No, I mean, honestly, what you should feel is brave because I think that there are so many people that can learn from that, that are afraid to have that same conversation, right? It's such a hard conversation to have. And I never thought I would ever have to go to therapy for anything. But um, for you to become a role model for that, I think <laughs> speaks to your character. I mean, well, that's thank you. fantastic. Um, and I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, you're just, okay. I think it's so you're visualizing colors. So think of a color that makes you feel happy and it makes you feel very calm. And then envision green. Color. No, <laughs> like dude, whatever. Uh, mine was mine was blue. Um, okay. And and it's the same blue that's on my background on my logo. FYI. Um. No, see that 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 right there is awesome because you you that's really a piece of you yeah um anyway wow. so envision that color all around you and try to be engulfed in that color and then take deep breaths and then it's just that that, that color kind of becomes a part of you for that for that distinct second um, another thing is you know imagine that you're somewhere where it's completely peaceful and mine is Cozumel um, we went there on our honeymoon. Oh, where where did you stay in Cosmo? Oh, it was on a cruise. But Cosmo, oh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, did you go carnival. snorkeling in Cosmo? Huh? Cosmo's awesome. That's where I want to take Katie. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, we went. Um, we went swimming with stingrays. Nice. We did the dolphins. That was, that was oh, that's cool. awesome. Yeah. Stingrays are. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to animals. Of the, of so. The you, so Blue is your color. Cozumel is your place. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that that's my place. And then, yeah. So, it's now just, is music is music a thing for you in this at all? Mm, it helps I'm just curious. <laughs> Not exactly. It helps when I'm writing. For my husband, it is 100. Um, percent Music helped him get through a lot of depression when he was growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, and it still means a, a lot to him. He is, he's got a tattoo of a band on his calf because that band oh, helped cool. him get through life. Oh, um, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, music helps me on, on the street, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I can't listen to Bohemian Rhapsody on my motorcycle anymore because I get too wrapped up in the song and I start singing and I start dancing and I, and I almost got in a head on collision because I was listening to that song one day. Um, My bike's named after a queen song. So that's, man, awesome. that's good. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, and my, my music selection is all it's, it's from classical to country to some, I hate it, but rap. And then some How can you uh, hate rap. Have you seen the crap that they're putting out nowadays? I was talking Biggie. I was gonna go all you know. Okay, I'm okay with that. A little bit. Okay. But the the rap that I have is like early 2000s to 90s. Oh no no. Um and then um old school. 
Uh, so old school rock, old school, you know, um, rock ballads, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, my, my music choice is so eclectic. I can't really say that music really helped me through recovery, but some people it does. And some people it's their vice and 100%, you know, if that's your thing, use it to as much as you can. So, um, but yeah. (laughs) So, so what do you, what do you tell the person that's in your shoes that if you don't mind me asking that, is struggling to seek help. I mean, because there, there's always that defining moment. I know for me, there was that defining moment of whether it was like, look, I can, I can whip out on this or I can tackle it head on. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you, what would you say to that person? So it would of course be individualized because I don't. Sure. No, I guess that's true. Um, yeah. It's, but... it's broad based. A lot of people don't realize that the struggles that they encountered growing up from childhood, really from before you can even remember, mold you to who you are today. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, most of the time, talking to someone who's trained in how to define those characteristics and seek where they come from or where they originated from can help you out of what you're doing and what you're going through today. And that's the big thing is my therapist taught me more than just about PTSD. She, she helped me through my best friend, childhood best friend um, passed away in 2013. She was 20 years old with Ewing sarcoma cancer. And um, she's who I base my life off of now. Like I'm trying to be the person she was. Um, But she helped me realize that, you know, everything that I went through for her with her was not bad. And like, she, she, it, she just helped me and I've been struggling with this for the past eight years and she can still help me with it today. And a lot of, you know, issues that I had um, in my marriage were brought up or were, were um, originated from how I was taught or not taught how to do stuff, you know, growing up, what my parents Mm -hmm. did or did not teach me Mm -hmm. growing up. And so it just opened my eyes to really how deep um, a therapist can really dig into your past and help you with today and moving forward. And you don't know that until you take the jump and take the leap to actually get help. And it takes a very, very strong person to seek help. And once Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the hardest step is to seek it. And then moving forward, they're just appointments that you go to just like the doctor, just like the dentist. And you need to treat it as such. Um, And your therapist should make you make it feel like a very safe place when you're there. And if it doesn't feel like a safe place, there's always another therapist. Like if you don't like your, if you don't like your general practitioner, there's always another one out there. Um, so I had that experience and it's, it's really weird when you think that, you know, you're making a step and you're talking to somebody, you're like, there's just no, (laughs) no, we're not doing this. And some, some people, you know, just mesh with you. I got very lucky on mine, but it, it, I, I know, you know, some of my friends have went through three or four therapists. Um, and it's just, you know, you're nothing's wrong with you. There's nothing that you're doing wrong. It's just the not the right therapist for you. So many people feel like it's they're they're beyond fixing and they're beyond, you know, help, but you're you're never beyond assistance like whatsoever. So um, and I do want to plug um, Um, betterhelp.com. That's how we found my husband's therapist. And excellent. He was. We'll uh, put, I'll make sure I put a link in the video because, like awesome. I said, that's um, that's a theme that I try and bring up, and I think that that's great that you shared that. Yeah. So, um, I specifically searched for PTSD therapy for mine because I knew I was looking for a specialized type of therapy. But for him, um, you know, we went to BetterHelp.com. He signed up. Um, they do provide discounts if you are, you know, not able to afford something, mm-hmm. um, and. Um, 
yeah, he he went through a questionnaire and they asked asked him, you know, between race, gender, um, religious preference, whether he wanted a Christian um, therapist or not. Um, we weren't really privy to anyone. He didn't really mind. Um, but yeah, they ask you a brief questionnaire and you'll have a therapist reach out to you and you'll get matched with one um, within 48 hours. So that was pretty cool. And, you know, his, his ended up working out really well. And I awesome. And that's a great resource. Yeah, dude, I was skeptical about it because I hear betterhelp.com. Like I see commercials on TV and I see they're on my Facebook feed all the time, probably because, you know, um, big brother's watching and I talk about therapy a lot, but, um, no, they're not watching. No, not (laughs) at all. Um, but yeah, they show up Um, on my Facebook page. We know they are just, (laughs) They probably will. Uh, but yeah, I was skeptical about it, but you know, I didn't know where else to go. And that's a good resource. If you don't know where to go, if you, you know, search, be it sometimes a Google search is simple, but it, it doesn't cut it. And you don't get this personalized recommendation for you. And they give that to you. That's awesome. I mean, I think that that's fantastic. Because I, I think that that's sometimes the hardest thing with getting help is where do you start? And like you said, it's not just what you're going through today. I mean, I always tell people that not necessarily literally, but we all pay, we all, we all are tasked with the sins of our fathers, you know, as Mm -hmm. our fathers, our mothers, you know, it's not that anyone did anything wrong. It's all just part of your DNA at that point, you know, and you know, I do want to share how you deal with things. Yeah. I do want to share that, um, getting therapy isn't an end all be all I am medicated for depression mm-hmm. and I just, I have been medicated for depression now for three months. And just because you're currently medicated for depression doesn't mean you always will be. Yep. Um, and just because you are currently going through therapy doesn't mean you always will be. So I was in therapy for 12 weeks and I didn't feel like I needed it anymore, but I still have the contact of my therapist and I can always text her or email her if I feel like I need a talk. And I'll probably was, still will check up with her, check up with her every few months or so, um, just to keep myself in check. But um, you know, another misconception about therapy is that once you're once you're seeing a weekly therapist or biweekly, um, you you always have to do it, and that's just no. not the case. It's some some programs are twelve weeks. Um, some people talk to them for years, but you don't have to. Um, you know, I worked through all my shit in twelve weeks, and. It, it definitely helped. I, I mean, know when I went helped. through, like it was just like life changing. <laughs> yeah, when I went through my divorce for my first marriage, that was the whole thing. It was like this is a plan. This isn't, this isn't a sixteen mm-hmm. year commitment. This is we're yep. gonna have a plan. We're gonna get through this, and doesn't mean that it can't be open ended. But I think to your point, yeah, I, I think that a lot of people think that with medication and therapy that it's it's a full commitment for the rest of your life and it doesn't need to be. No. I would almost argue it's better to have a plan to have mm-hmm. an exit plan, because if you don't, I would almost question maybe if that's the right decision for you, or at least exactly. maybe not the right person, because there comes the fine line between I'm getting a paycheck from this person or I'm helping this person, you know, and it's, Absolutely. it's tough. And this whole conversation, it's just, it's just, um, it really needs it to happen more often, mm-hmm. but I do, you know, I feel like I'm just going back and forth, but it's okay if you need to be medicated for your entire life. <laughs> My brother, no, 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 no. And I don't, please, I don't want anyone to think absolutely, that. I'm just saying I'm that it, that. I, I'm I trying appreciate to the, the fact bases. that <laughs> that's where I was, right? I had medication absolutely. for depression. It was great for when I needed it. It was right in the beginning of COVID. And then after a mm-hmm. while, I couldn't think straight. And I was like, all right, well, this is, now we have to make the decision of whether yeah. this is helpful or mm-hmm. is this not beneficial. And yeah. in that, I was able to find coping skills and work with my wife exactly. and say, okay, these are the things I need, you know, and, and we can get through it because um, I don't, I yeah. think so many people think that that's a defeat you're giving up. And I, I, I would disagree. Sometimes your mind just needs to check out for a while. Absolutely. For lack of it, that's a non-medication, non-medical term, but yeah, it's the only way I can think to explain it. Absolutely. Um, but you know, it's just, um, it's, it's, it, 
this conversation is just very, very personal and it varies with each person that goes through it. So what, whatever is working um, for a specific person, there's no right or wrong. And I'm trying to talk to the person watching this right now in, uh, as a video or on the podcast or whatnot. There is no right or wrong to mental health. It's whatever mm-hmm. works for you. 100%. My brother is medicated for depression and he will be medicated for depression for the rest of his life. He's also suicidal, but he had to have that conversation with himself that, and he realizes that this is something that he needs in order to stay sane and in order to give him the relief that he needs. And he's been on this, you know, he's been medicated for probably about 10 years and he had the conversation with his doctor and he wanted to stay on the medicine. So he has, and I, I talked to him about everything. Um, and he's the person who encourages me to, you know, get help, men, uh, mental help. And yeah. that's, that's my brother. Cause usually men aren't open to those kind of conversations, no. but I'm trying to make this a, uh, uh, I'm trying to openly talk about it with you, with my YouTube, you know, family, just to make people aware that it's not, uncommon. Well, and and I think that's the problem. We need to break the stigma. I have a Zoom call that I do every week as a mental health check-in with people. And it's just a bunch of people. And, you know, sometimes we're just talking about motorcycles, but it gives Mm -hmm. somebody an opportunity to know that, okay, well, maybe I could, I am Brian later and be like, hey, I'm having these feelings or what have you or whoever. And yeah, we need to break the stigmatism and men are the, are the absolute flipping worst I mean, it's just, it's in our DNA and it needs to stop. Yeah. And um, that's, I'm also trying to reach, you know, men as far as um, getting back on the motorcycle and talking to like embracing my feelings to men to help them realize that it's not just a chick thing to be in your feelings and Mm -hmm. feel alone. Um, so I'm trying to break that stigma as well, as far as recovery and recovery, because, you know, we're all, you know, together and we are, we understand. Um, yeah. And I, I try to explain that, which there, there's a gentleman, um, he, he's about, he's around my age, I think, mid, mid thirties. Um, and he broke his back in a, in a motorcycle accident on Blood Mountain um, about a month ago. And um, I actually gave, cause I had a recliner um, given to me and it was like one of the old people recliners that literally stand you up and then yep. lay back, lay you back. And I slept on that for four months, um, but he broke his arm, broke his, uh, broke his back um, and broke his hip. And I, I, I gave him the, I gave him a link to my YouTube channel and say, Hey, if you never did anything, you know, reach out, um, you know, I'm this, that, you know, I, I, I've been through this before and I also slept on this recliner for four months, but I'm no longer using it. Do you want it? Um, and I gave it to him. Um, and I mean, th- th- those things aren't cheap. So all I asked him to do is, you know, give it to someone who and needs it, it next yeah. um, because it was given to me and I just didn't feel like feel right selling it. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I'm just, I'm trying to reach as many people as I can to kind of, you know, share my experience of recovery. Um, and, and I think that that's what makes your chan- channel genuine, right? Oh, and thanks. I, I th- and, but I also think it's hard because there's this part of YouTube that's all clickbait, you know, or it's trying, trying to draw to somebody in. I'm trying to find a good balance. Because, you know. I can say this, if you ever want to just have fun, just troll the Harley people. They get all spun up and then, you know, then you get a thousand views and then you can go back to doing these. <laughs> well, I thought I was going to do that. Um, to be honest, just as I made a video well, on how to fill yeah. up your gasoline in your Harley. And yeah, people were, it's really, really? amazing. Um, and it's a shame because that's where I feel like it's become like this, this is helpful, right? You talking about your experience is helpful, but I feel like it gets drowned out in the, oh my God, I almost died. You know, and it's the video where the truck's like 8,000 feet away, but it turned. Or if you say, oh, I'm sorry, this is a pet peeve, but I, it just now happened. I broke my motorcycle. 
no, you didn't break your motorcycle. It just got a flat tire. <laughs> like, yep. Or like, oh my God, my, my, uh, what was it? My, my Indian, it was illegal. No, your, your tag just expired. Like seriously. It's the five things I hate about my motorcycle. Hey, I did like, do that one. Well, no, that's a good I'm one, but, but no, that. no. And, and, and I would argue though, the spin <laughs> of that could be, here's five things that I upgraded on my Harley that made it better. Right. It's the same video. Yeah, it but is. For whatever reason, the negative draws people in, you know, and, and you know, it's like. Um, next week's video, actually, um, if I already get it, you know, shot and everything, it's uh, five things that female motorcycle riders hate. And I will say this. Men. I put female in there. <laughs> I, it's, it, it's actually five things female motorcycle riders hate. And then it's got like the lo- lo- long line. I don't know what it's called, but um, men stop. Or like men stop doing this, something like that. And yeah, it's totally clickbait. But at the same time, I talk about stuff that I have encountered in real life that as women motorcyclists, we don't like. So number one, assuming that we ride a small motorcycle, assuming we don't know how to ride a motorcycle, assuming that we don't know how to, what to, you know, what we're doing, um, hitting on us, assuming that we're doing it for attention. You know, it's just a lot of assumptions that men make. Well, if you're on Instagram, we're allowed to hit on you, right? That's the rule. Apparently. I'm that's joking. <laughs> totally joking. <laughs> Apparently. Did you see the new Instagram? I'll send it to you if you haven't seen it. It's women writers in the community posting the IMs that they get from people. No, I'm and in a group on Facebook just for that. So we can I'm we have just to say- sitting there and it's like, are you kidding me? Like, is this? Yep. Wow. Um, I'm in a, I'm in a Facebook group that was created just so we could share that with each other. Um, huh. so we have a safe space to kind of make fun and poke fun at it and seek advice on what, how we should, you know, and do it like ha- how we should approach that stuff. Because we still like me, I, I don't like being mean to people, but sometimes you just have to tell them to F off. I mean, yeah, no, just, the- sometimes you just have to do that. I think the the best comment that I ever saw on that was John Maxwell. And his comment was, you know, when you, when somebody calls you, you know, like I made a video, the video about getting gas and people were saying like, Oh no, no, no. I did a video about million dollar Bogan and about his uh, thing for mental health. And, you know, mm-hmm. people were like, Oh, you're fat and you're stupid and you're weak. And it's like, and so once you reply back and you're like, Hey man, thanks for watching. Click delete. But, um, someone, uh, so the the video of uh, by the way you can cut any of this shit out I know no, we're it's fine no no I don't care we're gonna go over but this is okay I oh. honestly and I want to leave this part <laughs> in I can't tell you how much I appreciate your honesty because so many people are so afraid to be realistic it, and it, you know it's yeah. the reality of the world. It, it is, you but, know. Uh, you know, when I did started, you know, before on Instagram, before I started YouTube, I would always worry about, you know, doing my makeup and making sure my hair was right. And then when I got on YouTube, you know, after that specific, there's one video where I'm like, I'm almost crying <laughs> in the, in the video. Um, is but, that the know, one where you're talking about the, um, oh crap, it's the one when you're in the laundry room, room isn't it? Yeah, there's yeah. one when you're in your feelings, dude, I was trying not to cry watching oh. that. And, but um, that's what makes it genuine. Well, and I, I think there's a difference between getting viewership and getting a connection. Well, that yes, absolutely. Um, and I want to create a community around what I'm doing on social mm-hmm. media, but I, I cut this out of one of my past videos, which I, I'll talk about this one day, but in my YouTube, if people go to my YouTube channel, they're going to get me. They're not going to get me on a good day. They're, and mm-hmm. they're, they're not going to get me all dressed up. Like right now, I don't have makeup on. <laughs> like, um, I just, uh, and as much as I hit my glasses, I just didn't feel like wearing contacts today. But like they're, they're going to get me, whether it's a good day or a bad day. Whether I, you know, and sometimes in my, we're rebuilding the CB750. And then on the second video that I uploaded, episode two, There was a second there where Joey encouraged me to, you know, film, but I just didn't really feel like feeling and filming and I just didn't, wasn't feeling good. So I kept that footage in there and I just put, sorry, I wasn't, I was having a bad day, but that's like, I include that in my YouTube channel because I feel like I'm not being genuine if I don't. 
-hmm. And some days I just don't freaking feel like filming. So I just, uh, I just, I try to be as transparent and as open as I can because I want to make that connection for, to people. And I want people to feel that, you know, my content is genuine because it, it is. So, um, so yeah, I well, just, I don't. And I, and I know that we have a, a mutual uh, connection in Moto Blonde. And that's the funniest thing I think with her videos is like, I love her so much. <laughs> she's doing stuff. And then she's like, Oh, I messed this up. And I think it's legit. And it makes it so genuine rather yeah. than being like, Oh, it went perfect. And you know, damn well, it took 20 hours to film a five minute install. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Yeah. So um, yeah, I love her so much. Um, She's awesome. I felt like she was my best friend after just talking to her for five minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so uh, that's just my main thing about, you know, my channel and social media is that I just, I'm trying to embrace who I am on that day. It changes daily and, you know, being as um, open and honest with it helps me be honest with myself on who I, uh, as far as who I am. Cause I really did have to find myself when I didn't have motorcycling to numb my pain. That's wow. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you get more genuine than that. That's fantastic. I think it's great. Yeah. I think um, that there's so many people that try and become a personality or something they're not. And it's, and I always know, tell people, if you meet me in person, even in my craziest, like, you know, being stupid videos, it's, it's me and a cup of coffee. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to be somebody I'm not. Well, you know, in my videos, um, I, I, I will say I am more energetic in my videos than I am in person. I'm a very, very, well, you have to be, it's, but you have to be, that's yeah. a part of it. That's a part of being engaging. Um, it's the best advice I've gotten, which if you start YouTube and you start, you know, moto vlogging, and if you're serious about it, um, you listen to Nick Nimmin and other people that, you know, um, give YouTube advice. And one of the best things that I've, one of the best ad, ad, things of advice, one of the best pointers I've ever gotten is be yourself times 10. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly what you have to do um, is, you know, you think you're at a 10, but you're actually at a two or you, you know, I've last few videos. I've had, I'm trying to up my content up my energy a little bit um but i like to do jumping jacks or like i scream or do blah, 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 that stuff <laughs> um just to kind of loosen up a little bit um mm -hmm. so because I'm, I'm so freaking nervous before i hit the play like it's crazy um and i shouldn't be but it's just not it's it's normal to be nervous in front of the camera um i'm you know and at work I do video editing, but I'm always behind the camera. So yep, it's weird. As am I. Yeah. So it's weird being the topic. It's weird being. But I thought this was a good thing to sort of start because then I can sort of explain to people, well, this is what I do. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, it makes it a little bit more genuine because we have, I work for, I do videos for sales production and nice. our salespeople could sell snake oil to a snake. Mm -hmm. But you That's put a husband. camera on, done. <laughs> It's yeah. game over. Absolutely. You know, it, it's tough. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. Joey can sell anything to anyone. Like it, it's crazy how good of a salesman he is, which is why he's good at his job. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm two, two months in and I just, I, I love doing it. Well, Britt, as we wrap this up, I can't say thank you enough for your time. I mean, your story is a, is amazing, and uh, I'm flattered that you took the time to come out. Is there anything you want to talk about as we finish? Anything you want to plug? Um, talk well, about your bearded dragon. What are we talking about? <laughs> well, my bearded dragon, his, his name is Norbert, and he's, he, he's a Harry Potter reference. So comment down below if you understand who Norbert is and Harry Potter. And okay. if you could comment below and how I could understand that, that'd be great too. <laughs> Just FYI, I have two snakes as well, and they're named Severus and, 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 and uh, Bellatrix. Okay, well, hold on. But what are the okay. dog's names? Because we're leaving them out. Kimber, which is named after a gun. Kilo, nice. because he's big and white, and my husband was an officer, like a, okay. a officer at the time. So he, he was thinking 
kilo unit, which is a canine unit. And he's also white. So it's a cocaine is white. And sure. He's, He's a German shepherd. And then Peaches is a little lab mutt and she's just a little asshole. So Aww. anyway, oh, she's a sweetheart, but she'll bite your head off in a heartbeat. Um, so thank you so much for letting me. Uh, Absolutely. You know, talk to you. I mean, um, I, I had, I very, very sincerely, like I, I, I had a great conversation. Like th- this has been, I knocked my glasses. This has been freaking awesome, dude. Like, this entire conversation. Any, anytime. It, it I, just mean, I appreciate your honesty. It's been fantastic. Um, but um, guys, if you don't know me or my YouTube channel, please do check me out. I am Britt Brapp. That's B-R-I-T-T-B-R-A-A-P. As in Paul, as in Pony. Um, as in Brapp. <laughs> yes. Um, and we'll put all the links down there. So anything you want to link, we'll, we'll put it in. Um, he's also going to link below my personal website, which is, uh, I have a blog as well. Um, nice. I like to write and it's just, you know, I've always liked to do that. And um, yeah, just, you know, check out my stuff. Um, if you want to know more about my accident and what happened to me, it's actually on my YouTube channel. It's the very first video um, mm-hmm. that I ever posted. Um, and it's 17 minutes long, so it's not too terribly long. And please bear with me because I put a weird um dolphin sound every time i cussed and i quickly dropped that because i realized how annoying it was so guys please do um just i don't know if you want to check me out if you don't want to check me out you know just leave that they need to check you out your story is nothing but positive (laughs) and uh yeah if you happen to want um custom helmet custom logo work or artwork or if you want to buy my hoodie because it's really cool and yes i i drew that oh um, very nice i really hope it showed um i'm gonna so, buy that and i'm not afraid to wear a helmet with a bow so it's awesome because cool. my dad was um <laughs> go to my website and there's actually a brap nation merch uh, link on there and nice. you can also um, buy stickers and buy my hoodie or a t-shirt if you'd like to um but yeah uh thank you and i just want to please ask everyone to ride safe and please remember to be nice to one another because you never know what other people are going through and that's how we end <laughs> there it doesn't get better than that thank you Britt, so much for your time